I work in this firm called Morningstar. Uh, it's a US-based global uh, leader in rating mutual funds, and they are also into making quantitative models uh, for equities and indexes, uh, which we call mutual funds again. Um, I used to work a lot on the NLP side, but now I also work on the quantitative side. And uh, I recently participated in this hackathon and were able to secure the first prize. So I'm also interested in this application of uh, reinforcement learning and deep learning in the algorithmic trading as well. Uh, I started this funny title called Dog versus Labrador versus German Shepherd. And I go through this new slide. Can any, anyone guess like what's the correlation between uh, this title and the other title? Labrador and German Shepherd are actually species of right, 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 exactly, exactly, exactly. So a lot of time people talk as if deep, deep learning and reinforcement learning are very separate things. They are not machine learning, but anything that is learned by machines is, is machine learning. So that's why I mean I mentioned the two species of the dog itself. So everything is machine learning, but just to identify uh, algorithms separately, we use these uh, terms. So I'll be touching brief on the classical ML and show you uh, intuition about how deep learning works and uh, also talk on the intuition of the reinforcement learning. So as you all know about uh, supervised machine learning, the classical ML algorithms like uh, linear regression where it's like a linear plane is being created if it is a multivariate thing. Uh, if it is uh, SVM, then a non-linear plane is being created to separate the things for classification or make a complex function to, uh, to predict a value. Or if uh, things are more complex and data is highly unstructured kind of stuff. Um, we also have decision trees and there are some limitations of decision trees. So then we use random forest to average out the uh, voting of decision trees and then we have uh, boosted forest. Uh, to take care and have higher weightage for the unclassified things. So that's what supervised learning is. And that important thing about supervised learning is that we need tag data. We need the mapping from X to Y that, okay, if it, this is a picture of a dog, then a picture should be equal to the dog. That's the X to Y mapping. So that's what we require for supervised learning. And those algorithms I mentioned are on the classical side. On the unsupervised side, uh, what we are primarily trying to do is like, uh, remove the noise out of the info, uh, information that we have. Like there are so many features, like sometimes we are working with a large data set, we have hundreds of features and a lot of things will be either highly correlated or will be adding noise to the thing. So then what we do is like compress the, we represent the whole data in 20 dimensions and then try to remove the features directly or indirectly or uh, rotate or turn the space of the dimension in such a way that we are able to represent the whole thing in a much compressed way and it also makes sense. So we use algorithms like PCA, ICA, we have uh, uh, k algorithm. Uh, then we also have PSNE for visualization. So those kind of algorithms are done to uh, represent the same thing in either 2D or less dimensions than the than earlier. Now comes the other part, the deep learning. Uh, so, what's the necessity of deep learning is a question in itself, like what is the limitation of those other algorithms that we are talking about. So, in, in a generalized way, what are we exactly trying to do, the mapping from x to y. So, in between there is a function which maps the x to y and every algorithm has certain limitations when it comes to a data. So now, how does deep learning change the whole game in itself? In this. Generalized architecture, you must be knowing that there we get the uh, input layer where we give the <coughs> data that we have. So sometimes it's just a, a 2D array where every row represents a, a set of data. And either it's an image, so it can be 2D or 3D depending on color or just a grayscale image. Um, sometimes it's uh, audio also. So all that is given as in the input. And in the hidden side, we can play with as many layers as we want. And so every layer that we add is adding a non-linear function to the whole thing. 
so the more deeper the neural network the more complex and non linear functions are we creating and we have this flexibility with this we don't have that with other thing uh, other algorithms in the way that we have with this one so deeper is equal to more non non uh, more non linear and uh, uh, having more neurons on one layer uh, means we can again am uh, mapping to more complex functions and then on the output uh, we have the y uh, the y variable so now what is exactly this uh, one neuron is representing it represents it is one neuron is representing a uh, non linear function and it can be anything and there are lot of functions this is the sigmoid function that we have and its responsibility is to take input and give the output which is uh, ranging from 0 uh, to 1 and we take this output from lot of neurons and give different weights according to how one neuron is talking about uh, a particular information and we use a backprog algorithm to optimize these waves and we finally find out like which neuron neuron is actually taking talking more sense and which neuron is not uh, able to give any information so this weights change and we are able to create that complex function that we are talking about to map the y to x so this basically this weight, weights are like voting mechanism uh, for the whole thing so there is this thing called universal approximation theorem uh, and There is this nice uh, article on this, which I would like to just skim through. It's not loading the images. Okay, okay. So suppose there is this curve, which is this looks like a random uh, curve to me, uh, which is mapping this x to the y. Ah. Uh, so when we have this very simple neural network with just one hidden layer input and output we the out the out the, this function that is finally created is f of x uh, for the given f of x for i mean that is allowing us to output the y if we have multiple functions then uh, multiple outputs then this functions are going to be uh, different functions of this x1 x2 x3 so now the sigmoid that we are talking about that is actually a non linear function and it sometimes it it will feel intuitively that how can we use this weird curve to just represent every other curve in the world uh, but it so happens that uh, when we tweak the values of this bias and weights in such a way it suddenly is able to approximate a uh, different kind of function so over here it is approximating a step function and this is just like uh, one layer with two neurons and as we go on increasing the layers and neurons uh, it can create complex functions uh, as required according to the weights and and weights will be optimized according to uh, the output so if the output is a step function then the weights will be uh, uh, created accordingly so if we see different weights different outputs uh, so more so more complex the output the in, i mean the whole uh, curve the more neurons are we requiring to create that thing so i hope you are able to grasp the intuition that i am trying to explain to you that the more complex the curve the more neurons it is required to represent the whole function and in the 3d it looks like this although it it, it is explaining the same thing <clears throat> let's go now let's try to visualize in real time what exactly i was saying <clears throat> so now the whole thing is about uh, mapping non linear functions kyunki linear chahiye to linear regression hai uh, but non linear mein we have some issues so there is this zor function very famous non linear function that 0 0 it gives zero output 0 1 1 One zero up to up to here it makes sense okay बढ़ेगा तो बढ़ेगा but over here when both are one it gives zero so now this is not easy this cannot be represented by linear regression just not possible so for this uh, there is the sample neural network with just two neurons in the hidden side two inputs as required and one output so when we start to train this if you see initially just with this random initialization it is not actually giving us the Uh, output that we are expecting oh, is required is zero. It's point six. All are like around point six. 
So as we start to the, uh, train this and these weights will uh, start to change according to these iterations, these values will converge to what we are looking for and that's how the whole cost optimization is happening. And uh, it can be stochastic gradient descent or atom or nested or anything can be there. And uh, over here, the parameters are like this, sigmoid functions are being used. Uh, <clears throat> and then within like 30,000, it almost uh, converges to what we want. Now, let's go over here and I can actually add more data points over here and see how it is making sense. Okay. Mm, let's stop this. So now, one one over here and uh, reds are over here and it is it is it has created successfully a boundary uh, to do the classification or give the output now if i add more green over here let's keep this running is it running okay so if i add green over here it's not going to change anything because uh, the boundary is correct but if i add it over here it suddenly changes the whole decision boundary and now it is able to create new weights and biases to map the same thing. Uh, okay, but now, okay, I had a lot of green over here and if I want to add a red over here, what exactly will happen? So if I add a red, it is in a dilemma, like how can I represent this red? Like how can I create a boundary to just <laughs> say that, okay, this red is a red, but it is not able to do it. Uh, and uh, okay, let's let's put some red, more red, and see how it behaves. So now the whole thing is shifting towards where more red are there. <coughs> okay, now it is able to take those red also into the red boundary as well. Now what can happen if I add more neurons? Let's just try it out and see. So in the hidden, there are two. I add more more neurons. I guess I added six neurons. Uh, I lost the, this whole thing is refreshed. I will just refresh this thing. <clears throat> um, I'll add more green. Oops. So I'm, I'm trying to put a red between the green and see how it behaves and can it map it or not. And I will, I will increase the neurons on the hidden side and see if that makes a difference. So currently I am having two neurons and I am going to increase the neurons over here. So now if you see, it is if these decision boundaries are not generalized, this is almost overfitting because it is creating a very specific boundary for only those uh, red points. And this is, this is how we define overfitting, just remembering the data. There is no generalization over itna remember kar liya, itna kar liya, itna kar liya. And this is not how it actually should be. This whole, whole thing should be red or something should be there. Uh, there should be some wrong classification as well. And it is actually remembering everything because we have that many weights to, uh, make those complex boundaries that we require. Let's stop this. So that's, that's the thing I just wanted to convey about uh, the decision boundaries and nonlinear functions of the neural network. And again, the same thing, how supervised thing works in deep learning, you give an image and uh, it gives an output. Uh, and then if you see, we are just, creating features out of features their input has like, let's say hundred variables uh, as input. <clears throat> and then we have lesser and lesser features like as we have must have read some articles by Kola or Karpathy that uh, initially it remember, it tries to extract the edges and it creates in the next day, it creates shapes. And then it understands the whole image. So every layer is actually extracting only a certain features out of it and then use those features in the next layer to create more complex functions out. Uh, in, in the unsupervised side, we have this thing called autoencoder where we take the input and then give it to the output as well. 
and then we are just creating a neural network which re which actually represents the input itself now what's the usefulness of such a thing why would we do that that's not even a business problem in itself um, so by doing this as i said that in neural network we just go on reducing the variables and try to represent the same input in lesser features so over here if we see we have one two three four five six seven eight nine nine uh, let's say features to represent the input it's a 2d but just let's say imagine it's 1d so nine then the same thing is represented not exactly but it's an approximation represent by six uh, variables let's say then it's the same thing is represented by five and over here it's represented by four now the whole information the image is compressed it's like see it's like image was so big and then we have suddenly created a very small image out of it uh, size wise and then from the same we are creating the image again which is of the original size so does that mean that this information that we have is enough to represent the information that was over here so now the usefulness of this is uh, a bit on the software engineering side that if you have to uh, let's say create uh, recommendation algorithms which work on the similarity on the scale of amazon or google or uh, creating search engines and what not then having a compression of data from this to this makes a huge uh, cost saving on the business side so for for certain applications and now that's like the paisa bachane wali cheez but there are also other things that we, we can do with that so for lot of other applications uh, we actually interested in the compressed information so that's the whole thing about unsupervised learning now comes the reinforcement learning how 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 is it different from supervised and unsupervised uh, what makes it so different so in the supervised we are very clear we need the tag data otherwise we cannot do anything <clears throat> on the unsupervised side we are interested in representing the whole information in a compressed way now on the reinforcement line uh, learning the thing is that we want to do something like supervise but we don't have the tag data so then we have this whole mechanism that simulates that kind of system which is like a supervised thing uh, it's like a teacher and a student kind of stuff where a student tries to learn something um, and then give an exam but exam in the exam it does not perform well so teacher says gives a feedback kind of thing that okay you need to improve on this you are going in the right direction you are going in the wrong direction and then according to that feedback the student works again and uh, tries to perform better so let's take this scenario it's a very classical scenario that is given in lot of books that <clears throat> there are this bunch of ladies who are interested in playing uh, the slot machine in a casino now this is the whole thing how the reinforcement learning works there is an agent the agent acts on the environment and it this creates a reward and the state is changed from st to st plus 1 so what is the agent over here let's say the lady in the blue dress is the agent the person who is going to perform an action what is the environment over here environment is the whole casino with having let's say 10 slot machines so now the lady has very or he is interested only playing with the slot machines not anything else so we have defined our environment and in the environment also uh, she can what she can see what is observable environment is uh, uh, she can only look at the the pattern that is coming on the slot machine and only uh, she can on the action wise she can only pull the lever she cannot do much what's the implication of this if this this is called a partially observable uh, Uh, environment and if i had the environment where i have the complete information as in i know how what is the internal mechanism of the slot machine what are the exact positions of the gear if i pull the lever in this way in this machine what is going to be the motion of the gears and how it will be whether it will give me an output or not if i have the complete information uh then i know which slot machine to pull i just need to calculate the whole thing but we don't have that so it's a partially observable universe uh, on the analogy side in it's like finance uh, stock market uh, what is visible to me is uh, just 
the prices on the stock market. Um, I can see the balance sheet, the profits and loss statement, and uh, news articles. That's the environment that is visible to me. I don't know what is it going in the head of the CEO of the company. Uh, I don't have any other internal information which can help me to predict this better. If I knew those things, like what are the next step of the CEO, uh, are they doing any scam or not? If I have that kind of information, I can take uh, steps in a better way. But so my information is limited and I have to work with this limited information to predict the required thing. So over here, she has just the machine in front of her, the patterns and she is pulling the lever. Now the question arises in any person's mind, like which slot machine might turn out to be more lucky for me. <clears throat> so we have to go with the random selection, right? We, otherwise, unless we have some information that this machine is giving us more uh, rewards than other machines. But let's say we don't have any historical information of any person pulling the lever. And she is the one like, going to play it first. And she is the only one person who is going to play. So <clears throat> she is the agent. She is going to take the action on the environment. And uh, agent was, the environment was in a state ST. And after the action is performed, the pulling the lever, then uh, she, the environment is in a state ST plus one. And the reward that is generated, like if she wins it, she gets the reward. If she doesn't win it, uh, she, has to, she has to put some machine to play the uh, thing. So that is a negative kind of reward. So uh, she, that she gets a reward and that goes into the mind of the agent. So, so let's say she plays a machine a lot of times, she gets, does not get a reward. She understands this machine might not do something for me. So then she shifts to the other thing. So this, this is like a very common sense kind of thing, to, but how to put it in a mathematical way, like how to go and go about exploring the machines in a way that optimizes my rewards. <clears throat> so let's assume that we are going to pull lever K times, uh, on every machine. And so the average reward will be going to be summation of these rewards divided by K times. And there comes the concept of exploration versus exploitation. Exploration means that I want to try out different uh, slot machines uh, frequently. So I'm exploring, but exploitation means I'm going to take greedy action. Like if I just played on a machine which gives me small rewards, uh, but it gives me rewards and there is another machine which might give me once in a blooming kind of reward But I don't know if, if it is going to happen with me or not uh, So I just go and take the greedy action greedy action is the like the, uh, Taking the action which gives me the highest reward. So we are in a dilemma of this kind, right? We want to go and explore new food in different restaurants uh, So either we should go to the place that I already know it and serves good food at a good price or should I go around trying out other five restaurants and I know for sure some way in some in my past historical way that <clears throat> at least four out of this five is going to be uh, disappointment. So that's what the exploration versus exploitation is. <clears throat> so as we so as we change the value of uh, exploration, so e exploration is defined by epsilon over here. Uh, epsilon equal to zero as in I just take uh, action on one slot machine. Uh, I try it out, uh, no, I try out different slot machines equally. And then whenever I encounter a machine which gives me reward, I just uh, go on using that machine only. I stop exploring. If I put an exploration of, uh, let's say, 0 0.01, uh, it converts into like out of 100, 100 uh, actions. At least once I will try the new thing and see how it behaves, irrespective of how, how high rewards I'm getting. If I increase the exploration uh, to point 0.1, it means I'm, I'm going to try 10 out of 100 times. Uh, so I'm going to try more things. And so from the chart, based on the problem they defined, it turned out that uh, if you are stuck with the worst or not, sub, if you're stuck with the suboptimal return, your chart will be constant and it will be this one. Uh, if you have exploration, you will find out new slot machines that will give you more reward. And there exists an optimal epsilon. Of course, if epsilon is very high, you might have discovered the optimal, uh, the best slot machine and still you'll be exploring and you'll be losing out money. So there will be an 
optimal value of exploration as well. So point one, it, it so happens in this case, which I'm not trying to prove that more exploration is better because uh, then we come so in, in our way, in human way, we become the jack of all. We have to develop an expertise into something. So we cannot explore too much as well. So point one happens to be the best in this case, but don't take it that way. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, so when you say uh, uh, when the epsilon is uh, point, uh, zero 0.01, uh, it will take uh, ten, uh, one random action out of 100, right? Now, uh, when you uh, say 1 out of 100, it means those actions are within one episode or irrespective of where the episode is ending, 1 right. in every 10 action will be random. 1 in every 100 action will be random. How is it? Right. So in this case, in the slot machine case, the episode ends as soon as the action is taken, right? It's just one slot machine pulling and that's the episode in itself. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, in a game like Mario, if you are trying to do it, uh, um, I think we can try this, try exploring things and there will be different kind of things to explore, right? As the game is uh, moving from one. And what uh, about the market point of view? Uh, from the finance point of yes, view, yes. exploration, that's an interesting question. Let's take it at the end. I, sure, I think I'll sure. have to think. That's sure, a thank tough you. question. Yeah. <laughs> so, again, on the definition side, uh, episodic task is something like that ends on a, after a particular thing. So Mario, we know that this is, there is this stage and uh, there will be a lot of stages also, but at the end it ends. There is nothing like it just continues forever, while a game like PUBG might not end. It just works, keeps on continuing. I hope my concepts on the PUBG is correct. I have not played it, but I heard it a lot nowadays. So in that case, uh, we are, if we just keep on adding the reward in the infinite case, any action will give us an infinite reward. So we need to penalize it and uh, constrain it in a way. Uh, this is geometric progression which we have read in like 11 standard so we penalize the future rewards uh, heavily more heavily based on this lambda value so smaller the lambda it means if it is just let's say point 0.1 then we are heavily penalizing it we are every reward that we get in the next next action is just one time the value that we get in this uh, uh, this action so the more interested we are in the current uh, reward the nearby reward uh, the higher the value of lambda. So that is also a parameter to be optimized. There is nothing like perfect value for that. And in this kind, we just uh, sum, it, sum the whole reward till the uh, end of the stage, let's say. Another thing, uh, there is this beautiful thing called Marco property, where uh, uh, the definition is like, uh, State action, okay. The uh, the future the future state uh, that we are going to get is just a function of the current thing. So it's like I can just look at a person and I can see what is his current state. He has done an MBA in something and something. Let's say marketing. And I can be very sure that he is going to pursue a career, career in MBA marketing and marketing only. He is not going to do some architecture kind of stuff the next day. So I don't need his history also like kya pada usne, engineering kiya tha, arts kiya tha, I am not interested. It's an assumption of course, history plays a role and in finance also it plays a role. Uh, but it's an assumption which makes our whole calculation easy. Although uh, there are some research paper I read and in that uh, history is also considered. So this is a definition, uh, but it's not necessary to use it also. So when I was so when I was saying about the current state and the future state and the action and uh, things like things like that. So there is this uh, classical example called robot MDP. MDP is Marco decision process, and uh, so in this the problem statement is like. Uh, a robot is in a room. Do I have time? Okay. So a robot is in a room and the job of the robot is to collect the cans that are present in the empty cans that are present in the room. So a lot of people are drinking coke and they're leaving the can and the robot's job is to collect the cans. 
Now there are two approaches to this. Either the robot can just sit at one place and uh, uh, let people put drop the can into the collection bin, let's say, of the robot, or it can actually move and lose some battery but uh, collect more cans. So, <clears throat> so suppose it's in a high high battery state. So they have defined a high battery state and low battery state. In the high battery state. Uh, it can either search, go around and lose battery and search, or it can wait and collect it. In the low battery state, it can either search or wait or recharge. It has to recharge because now it's in the low battery state, it can stop anytime and we want to maximize the reward, so there should be recharge also. It should not stop. So, suppose, so, so I'm just trying to un explain you the uh, definitions of this thing and how they work. <clears throat> so, it's in a high state. It can search and then it, the new battery state can be high. If it's in the high battery state, it can search and go into the low battery state. And it's in the high, it can wait and still be in the high because there is no loss of battery. It's in the high, it can wait and uh, also go into the low battery state. Uh, so it, uh, but that's the probability of that is zero. Okay, that cannot happen. It's doing nothing. So probability is zero. Uh, Right, <clears throat> and uh, the rewards associated with that. So everything has different probabilities uh, based on the historical data. Uh, alpha, if one is alpha, then other has to be one minus alpha. One is beta, then other is one minus beta. And the rewards associated are different. Now, if it is searching, then it might find more cans. So the reward is different. It's, it will be more than the reward of waiting. So this is how the whole definition works. It's in state. Something is state as action is taken as this. And the probability of being in S dash, the new state, given the state and the action is defined is this way, and the rewards are also defined in a similar way. <clears throat> so then, the, this is called a transition graph, and uh, it's just a visual representation of the same thing. Now, I want to optimize uh, uh, this reinforcement learning problem in such a way that uh, I end up with the highest reward. <clears throat> so there is this thing called value function and there is this another called policy. So value function is uh, equal to summation of current plus all the future rewards uh, that can happen starting from the uh, current state and they are also discounted by this gamma. So it's like, uh, if, I, if uh, I'm going to take BTEC as an education, um, so the reward of doing BTEC, and let's say it's like every CTC of doing BTEC, uh, then after that I can do MTEC. There are a lot of ways, it's like a decision tree in itself. I can do MTEC, I can do MS from outside, I can do MBA, I can just do a job and then uh, there's like one step and then another step can be something else. I can do PhD. I can, if I was doing job, I can do MBA. If I was doing MBA, I can do job. So I was in state BTEC and I'm trying to sum up the rewards that I can get from BTEC to the future states I can be. So that is like a reward of being in BTEC, the value of, uh, value of BTEC, let's say. <clears throat> So now the competitors of BTEC can be other degrees that are on the bachelor's level. So, and this policy function is like a mapping that if I'm in BTEC, what is the best degree that I should be, not degree, what is the best action path I should take as a next career step uh, to get the maximum reward. So, so that's why like a lot, lot of people have found out that MBA seems like a good step <laughs> by just observing other people. Uh, it happens intuitively, but like it, on the mathematical level, if you want to represent it, it's something like this. And also, gamma is a very philosophical thing to me. Uh, like it, it doesn't make sense. We never plan for like what will what will be my salary when I be 50 years of age. We always plan it for like next two, three years or five years. So the importance of nearby uh, uh, state is more important to me than the future state. <coughs> So that's the whole value, value function and pi function. So we do the value function over different states and once we find out different rewards for different states, 
uh, then we just need to like do a max of the next reward state, then max of the new next reward state kind of stuff. And then we find out the mapping for the uh, action for a given state. So that is called a state action pair. It's like a 2D, uh, it can be 3D also, I guess, but uh, it's like a 2D kind of array uh, where let's say one, one is state and one is action. And so if you are in a given state, you just need to uh, do a max of the row, max on the row and take the action that uses the maximum reward. Right, right, right. So, how will the beta is on the Um, so it's so it's yeah, it's an analogy, but yeah, in the actual Q algorithm, it starts randomly. So, okay, I, I think there is a mismatch of that. Yeah, agree, agree. But I hope it also makes sense on some level, right? If you take the different states that are happening next by next, and if you are trying to find out the value of the beta. <coughs> Uh, that's how we'll do it, right? Okay, yeah, we can discuss more on that. Yeah, there are always this uh, certain considerations where we have a mismatch. <clears throat> so we are in this uh, room. Uh, I'm not going to uh, talk more on how exactly it will be done, but uh, we are in this room and we are starting at this two, and then uh, our aim is to just exit out of the room. So it, I can exit from here or here. And the whole thing is defined in this way that these are the rooms and I can move from one room to another. And uh, if I'm exiting, I'm getting a hundred reward. And if, uh, if I'm just moving from one room to another, which is not an exit room, uh, I get zero. So, <clears throat> so we defined an initial state uh, where the state is like any room that we have. Uh, and the action of going to another room. So minus one means that we cannot go into the room. If I'm zero, I cannot go into zero. And there is no connection between let's say zero and one. Zero is here and one is here. So that's minus one. So minus one is like not possible. Uh, <coughs> and zero is, uh, I can go, but that is, that's not the exit point. So, and if I'm in one or four, I can go to five and that will give me a hundred reward. So we initialize this whole thing and this is like uh, this. So rewards are already given and uh, we can run a Q, uh, deep Q algorithm on this and which is, this is called a Bellman equation and on the generalized level, it's like, what is the reward of the action that I will be taking from this st state and uh, what is the discounted reward of all the future actions. So that's this, the future reward plus the reward that I'm going to get. So when you run this Q algorithm on this, uh, <clears throat> ultimately you'll work up, come up with a Q table like this. And this all represent uh, the value that you're going to get from transitioning from one uh, state to the next uh, room that you can go. So of course, then you have to just do a max function over the row and uh, uh, take the Room that take the uh, next room that is going to give you the max value. So if you are in room three, uh, you see that there is 80, 51, 80. You can go into this all and this also. So if you are in three, uh, one, you can go from three to one and three to four, and both are going to give you uh, take you to the five in the same number of steps. So both are also having the same value of 80. And if you are going from three to two, you are going backwards, so that value is less. less. Uh, so this is a policy for the action that you have to take. Now, that's the whole thing about reinforcement learning and what are the different applications for this. Uh, so in finance, it's, uh, there are some research papers on uh, making indexes out of it. So currently there are different ways of making indexes uh, to find out the weights of the holdings of the stocks in a portfolio. but uh, Apparently, it can be also done by reinforcement learning where uh, you're not using some gradient descent kind of optimizer, but you are allowing uh, reinforcement learning to figure out that what kind of step, uh, what kind of rate should be there to uh, max, uh, maximize the future rewards. So in finance, why, why do we not use it for predicting? Um, that's 
that's a very tough question because deep learning uh, requires a lot of uh, data to train and there are a lot of things to train and what hap what is happening with finance is that they want explainability yeah. in deep learning it's it gets very different difficult to explain the whole thing so we have models in our company which we can train with deep learning the data is sufficient mm -hmm. but we still go with uh, non deep learning approaches just so that we can explain it to the investors and uh, other people who are going to use it so that so uh, you will actually have to give the investor because he is not supposed to ideally understand everything right he is just supposed to see your equity curve and invest so right right uh, do they really demand for what is happening to right. the right yeah they are demanding yes yes okay. so but uh, do you all try out those kind of models and any success rate if you could disclose um so we are trying out deep learning but we are specifically doing for nlp purposes in okay. stocks we are not doing it because uh, we are not able to figure out that how we are going to explain it okay. and i guess there are certain libraries that are coming up for yeah. explaining the deep learning exactly. uh, yes yes but we are still not convinced about that <laughs> so it of, of course comes from the top to bottom yeah. right and then uh, it it's like a there is always a delay between what we believe and what investor we believe and then we have to start pushing it aggressively yeah, yeah. then they will ex uh, uh, accept it yeah. also what others are doing in the industry also plays a role right so it gets a bit difficult agree and uh, in game theory and multi agent interaction so we already talk about talked about games uh, mario uh, in mario kind of environment it maybe it can be also applied to uh, playing football you might have seen beautiful mind so game theory is evolved from that and multi agent interaction so it can also be done to uh, so if there are a lot of agents participating in buying and selling of electricity if it is given to reinforcement learning it can actually find out ways to sell and buy electricity at lower price or higher price and make profit out of it so it we are talking about just one reinforcement learning agent but then lot of reinforcement learning agent can interact together with each other and that can be multi agent interaction uh, in robotics it is uh, <coughs> it is done to find out the motor workings the uh, the coding of the motor in itself like how the motion will be so that it moves certain things from one place to another in like least consumption of electricity would multi agent interaction be an analogy for ensembles or it, it doesn't work like um in ensemble yeah. as far as i know yeah. we are trying to take the uh, voting of different models yeah. for a given output yeah. both so all are inclined towards predicting one thing yeah in multi agent system that's like a uh, let's say 10 traders okay. trying to make a profit but our strategies are different our strategies are different okay. and there can be zero sum games right yeah. profit of one can be loss of other right. so when i was referring to multi agent system like everyone is a competitor to each other as far as i was talking about but yeah you can spawn an ensemble kind of uh, reinforcement learning also and give different kind of ways to optimize the thing so one rl can be just based on random forest and one hour can be based on dl and yeah. things like that yeah uh in vehicle nav navigation again uh, the vehicle has to go from one point to another and uh, it should not strike with people or trees or any other thing and consume electricity uh, consume electricity or fuel as less as possible so that's how it is being applied so let's just go to the end of the slides and uh, will be talking about this two examples so there are a lot of game ap applications that you must have seen watari games and uh, mario and what not so there is this new thing that came up in 2018 by an indian guy and uh, he trained a uh, rl agent just so that the the, the what you can say the player can actually take free kicks so it starts randomly but then it understands from the reward that we can see here uh, in the game and based on that it actually starts 
pressing the buttons in the power and the way that is required to put the code into the uh, place. So it takes the image as an input, extracts uh, features out of it, runs the queue learning, and then this OCR is done to just fetch the reward and basic use, use it to give the reward or uh, the penalty to it. Um, and then actually it try actually it improves and we can see it over here. So it, it just uh, tries randomly, but then it learns it. And then it also actually does left and right to, uh, to get the view of the goalpost uh, sometimes. And it also understands that if you are hitting this blue targets, then you are getting more reward out of it. And he has shown this chart where as more e epochs uh, are trained, the number of goals that you can put actually increases. Uh, so finally, it is able to put goals 50% of the times after 800 years. <coughs> so if you see in this case that there cannot be a training data, right? So it, it, it will be just a brute force kind of thing. So you can put the uh, goal into the goalpost, but from this, but just generating an input data randomly or in a particular way, you are getting a reward signal, and uh, from that it is actually understanding. So it's supervised, but not supervised kind of stuff. <clears throat> and there is this story about AlphaGo Zero. A lot of people have heard about AlphaGo. Uh, it was basically a, a algorithm um, based on deep learning. Uh, created to beat uh, the world champion in the game of Go. So what they did is uh, they took the training data of the games played by the world champions. Uh, basically, smart people are playing them. That's the best data to take, right? Uh, they won't take data of people playing like uh, people like us who are playing. So they took the best data, best strategy data, uh, trained uh, a deep learning model over it. And once the algorithm was trained, um, then they spawned uh, two algorithms and allowed it to do self play. So they play, the algorithm was playing with itself and uh, it reached a particular level of uh, ELO rating by which it was able to beat Lee Sido. But then what happened in this case is that the bias of uh, the players, the strategies of the players went to the algorithm itself. So then it uh, it was limited by what it discovered, but just by uh, how the Indian, uh, the, how the people were playing. Then they tried out another thing uh, where they didn't have any training data. They just spawned the one algorithm, RL algorithm, um, from scratch, and it learned on its own. Um, basically doing self play from the starting itself. So in that it's like it discovered that when actually you make uh, a positive move when you actually make a negative move and uh, in less data, in less time, in less processing power, it was actually able to uh, beat the alpha go that was that beat the league. And so it was also called alpha go zero because it started from scratch. So the, the power of reinforcement learning is that when there is no training data, there is no bias involved in it. And so it can achieve uh, a maxima or minima that is better than the supervised uh, learning stuff. <clears throat> so over here, the alpha go Lee, uh, that be the, with the Lee Steeler was trained on 48 TPUs and uh, the alpha go zero was trained on only four TPUs. And uh, it also, I guess, required less training days. Um, so in less time and less uh, data, it was actually able to figure out the right strategies and able to make moves that were not able to be understood by the humans who were playing against it. Or of course, humans were beaten by Lee and Lee, AlphaGo Lee was like the algo having the strategies of the human. So it was able to beat those strategies as well. So by RL in certain cases, we are going to be able to figure out new things that were not visible earlier. 
and there are also other things uh, these people tried so it was not just a self play from the scratch but there are also other things but majorly it was this self play from the scratch that made the whole difference so yeah that's all about ml dl and rl and uh, i also write this blog called ml-dl.com again it means the same machine learning deep learning uh, so over there i also write uh, blogs on hackathons and uh, how you can enter the data science industry what people are looking for and what are the courses you can pursue so feel free 